And finally, I want to um, address part three, which is um, coming at uh, markers from a different angle, and that would be SNP genotyping and QTL discovery. And as you'll see, there's a big genomics application towards uh, this SNP genotyping. Uh, the Rosebreed project, which I mentioned before, uh, has as one of, has one of its very important goals the development of high throughput genotyping platforms, which were to also developed for crops like apple, peach, uh, and uh, and cherry. Uh, and we also developed one. I say we, Nal Basile primarily, and her group uh, developed a 90k uh, SNP chip. Uh, via Appymetrics, and it was released in October of last year. And the focus of this array was on ploidy reduction. Uh, obviously, we have to have some way um, to focus on SNPs that are segregating in a diploid fashion. And it utilized a SNP detection panel uh, of nine diverse octoploid genotypes, uh, which were uh, important founders in uh, cultivated strawberry germplasm and important founders from different major breeding programs were included at the University of Florida. We um, submitted uh, two important founders for our program as well. This is an example of um, axiom SNP allele calling for different levels of allopolypoidy um, for uh, arrays that have been developed by API. On the left, you can see um, SNP clustering for diploid river buffalo, allotetrapoid rapeseed, on the right, further to the right, allohexaploid wheat, and then finally, octoploid strawberry. You can see that as we increase um, in uh, ploidy level, the clusters become closer together, but yet for you know high quality uh, SNPs, we can cluster BB, AB, and AA. Uh, basically homozygous, heterozygous, and the other homozygous class of genotypes um, uh, pretty well using this approach. Now, in order to effectively diploidize the genotype or, or find a number of SNPs that are homozygous, and let me go back, in other words, homozygous, AAAA, or NAA, and the other three subgenomes, and only segregating in one of the octopoid subgenomes, a lot of uh, genomics and, and bioinformatics went into the SNP design um, by Nala and her group. Um, just SNPs that were uh, developed based on the Fregaria Vesca uh, genome sequence, it, as it turned out, um, without any uh, real pipelining to focus on diploid SNPs, about 29% of those SNPs ended up being diploid uh, anyway. Um, other uh, reduced ploidy approaches that were employed that um, increased that to a 61% of diploid SNPs detected. Um, and these were approaches such as um, looking for insertions and deletions, usually small insertions and deletions of about six base pairs, when comparing the nine um, genotypes that were on the SNP detection panel to the Fergaria Vesca genome. In other words, targeting SNPs that may be segregating in one subgenome, and there's a deletion or an insertion at that same homeologous locus and the other three subgenomes, such that the probe will only interrogate the one subgenome. And so that obviously it was um, successful compared to just the random approach of designing SNPs to find diploid SNPs. But there was a, a third approach that was surprisingly effective, and that was what is called the SNP, SNP approach to SNP design, where 80% of SNPs that were designed turned out to be segregating uh, in a diploid manner, or be scored in a diploid manner. And this is really pretty interesting, so I want to uh, show you how this was done. And this was really intriguing to me when I uh, was talking to Nala and figuring out how this was done. So in this approach, um, I'm shown um, four subgenomes in four different colors here. So we have uh, red, green, purple, 
and blue. And so because we're in octopoid, we can have, um, you know, we have basically eight, uh, a possibility of up to eight different um, alleles at a, at a particular locus. But here we're focusing on the target SNP, which is the one on the right, which I've shown for this hypothetical example to be um, homozygous or heterozygous in each subgenome for, for T and G SNP. Okay. But uh, the SNP SNP approach uh, basically is looking for target SNPs that are in close proximity, three or six base pairs, from a non target SNP, uh, which can be used for the ploidy reduction strategy. So in this case, what we would do is we would design a probe that would only anneal where there is a G at the non-marker SNP locus, and then would interrogate the SNP locus on the right. So in this case, as you can see, this probe would only bind to uh, sequences within one of the subgenomes, and therefore we would be uh, only looking at segregation on the one uh, subgenome in red. Uh, another hypothetical example, in this case, what if we have uh, the G at the non-marker SNP in two of the different subgenomes? So we can still get diploid segregation. Uh, in this case, a probe would anneal to both the, the red and green subgenomes, but it only so happens that the SNP is segregating in the red sub subgenome, and thus we would get uh, diploid scoring and diploid segregation of that particular SNP. So that is the, the SNP SNP method for SNP design for reducing effective ploidy number. So uh, uh, out of uh, about there were there were about twenty one thousand markers uh, out of the ninety thousand markers on this initial chip that were categorized as um, um, high poly resolution SNPs that um, are robust. Um, and uh, the cl they cluster very well with, with a high confidence in SNP clone. And about 6,600 of those uh, SNPs uh, were um, uh, turned out to be polymorphic in a, a biparental mapping population, Holiday by Corona, that was uh, developed by Eric van de Beg at Wageningen in the Netherlands. And Eric was able to map uh, all of these uh, SNPs to uh, this octopoid segregating population. So uh, what we see here is we say essentially the diploidization of this, the octopoid genome such that here we have uh, chromes uh, linkage group 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. So rep representing one homeologous group. Um, but representing the fact that we have bivalent pairing within each of the four subgenomes, and therefore we have four sublinkage groups, and on and on through the, the total of the seven homeologous groups. So essentially, uh, what this showed is that we've, we've transformed a, an allo octopoid for mapping purposes into a diploid with all of these uh, SNPs that are segregating in a, in a diploid fashion. So this is just really, really exciting because now we have a tool. Uh, to really give us higher density um, SNP maps. So again, this is 6,600 of the 21,000 uh, markers that fell into the, the high quality class. So now as a breeder, I look at this and think, okay, how are we going to now utilize this for QTL detection and ultimately for marker development and breeding? And one of the questions that I, that I, that I ask is, okay, um, I know that, that I don't want to simply do QTL detection within a couple of biparental mapping populations, at least not for my breeding program, because it's a, a large, diverse uh, set of germplasm, and I want QTLs that I detect to be uh, relevant um, through at least a large portion of my breeding program. Uh, this is an example of a mating, a typical mating design that we would use in a given year. The genotypes on the left of the parents here are not particularly important. Uh, important that you see, and I realize the text is small, that you see what those are. But, you know, in a typical year, we would use 20 to 25 elite parents and, and do some of our crosses in a, in a circular dialyl mating design like this so that we can 
facilitate uh, quantitative genetic parameters uh, development and breeding values and so forth. And we might take uh, 10 to 15 individuals from each of these 100 families, each represented by the X's there in the cross combinations, and plant those out and do a lot of phenotyping to do progeny testing and, and develop breeding values for these, these parents that we've used and, and progeny down the road. So how do we do QTL analysis in populations sets like this um, that are very different from traditional you know, bifrontal mapping populations? Well, thankfully, there is software out there that allows us to do that, and that's where Dr. Verma comes in. Um, FlexQTL is a QTL um, uh, 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 analysis program that was developed by uh, Marker Bank and his associates at, at Wageningen. And basically, we can put our SNP genotypic data and all the phenotypic data that we're developing in our breeding trials on all those uh, diverse populations from that mating design and do uh, basically pedigree-based QTL analysis. It also works very well if you just have a large pedigreed set of individuals in a breeding program, which is a very realistic scenario for a strawberry breeding program. And you want to look at all that diverse uh, pedigree-linked material and do a, do a pedigree-based analysis for QTL detection. So we can, we can detect those QTLs. We can define functional haplotypes for those QTLs and eventually get to developing genetic tests for breeding. I wanted to give you an example of some of the things that have been done using QTL uh, uh, or Flex QTL by Suji and others uh, with these SNP markers from the new platform. So the first thing that was done was to just do marker checks, so to look at identity by descent and ask the question, are these markers segregating as they should be uh, with uh, few errors uh, in, a, in a set of given germplasm. So in this case, we're looking at a segregation of five SNP markers um, in holiday corona and some of their progeny. So FlexQTL has been run to basically do an inheritance uh, check on each marker to look at potential errors. And the initial results of doing this in a set of 260 pedigree linked individuals is that 97% of the markers tested, or 97% of the 21,000 markers um, uh, thus far, segregate properly without any errors based on pedigree. So that's, that's a really good result. So then we move on to actual QTL analysis. We, we as I said, have 260 pedigree linked materials uh, that were part of the rose breed germplasm that are very diverse but are pedigree linked. Uh, they span multiple breeding programs and multiple generations. But an initial QTL analysis was done on those using the SNP uh, data, the, uh, the 6,600 initially mapped SNPs for which we have mapped locations. Uh, and here's an example for titratable acidity. And we have on in the middle, you can see that high peak a significant QTL for titratable acidity on linkage group 4D. Uh, if you look at the y-axis, anything above about a 0.1 probability is considered a significant QTL and flex QTL. And this particular QTL explains approximately 10% of the phenotypic variance among that diverse set of germ germplasm. Also, just to illustrate the functional haplotyping feature of flex QTL, um, Suji developed uh, this visual, uh, which predicts the uh, QTL alleles and genotypes at that particular locus. So here you, you can look at uh, big Q, big Q, little Q, little Q, and the heterozygote, and basically have a prediction for all the pedigree-linked individuals of what their QTL genotype is at that locus. So that is particularly helpful and important for designing the actual genetic tests that would be used in breeding. So just to summarize uh, section three, um, it's, it's really amazing how the bioinformatics pipeline and the use of the uh, sequenced individuals was so key to effectively reducing ploidy and uh, being able to identify SNPs that are segregating in a diploid manner. Uh, in the end, we have 21,000 high-resolution SNPs now, 
that show that diploid clustering. Uh, we, uh, uh, 6,000, uh, about 600 or so were initially mapped in one population that happened to be polymorphic within that population. Uh, we've shown that they're segregating uh, according uh, properly, not just in that mapping population, but in a broad, diverse set of pedigree material. And we've even done some initial QTL analyses uh, using FlexQTL. And as far as next steps with the array, uh, we've uh, sent off, um, uh, uh, getting ready to send off a large number of materials uh, for genotyping on the array that represents breeding populations like the one I illustrated to you. And so we're raring to go and excited about that. Just to summarize the entire webinar, um, it's really exciting that we have these new approaches and tools, whether they be candidate gene approaches or the SNP platform, that I think are really going to allow a lot of applications to gen and genomics to breeding the strawberry finally in, in a big way. Uh, these can, tools can be used in fingerprinting, marker-assisted seedling selection, marker-assisted parent selection. Um, just this spring, for the first time, we're using the gamma decalactone marker in seedling selection in about 8,000 seedlings. Um, so we're really getting our feet wet um, with uh, using that PCR-based marker uh, in a big way in our breeding program. And in terms of next steps, um, we're excited to use the QTL analysis to undercover, uncover some genomic architecture of, uh, or genetic architecture, I should say, rather, of some important traits. We have a number of different disease resistance and fruit quality traits, phenotypes uh, in these populations where we really don't know anything yet about the uh, genetic architecture of those traits. We, we know in general what the uh, heritabilities are of these traits, that many of them are polygenic traits, but we don't really know much about genetic architecture of these five or fewer genes, a hundred or more genes. And so we're really excited to, to, to see what's going on there using FlexQTL. Um, in the future, we really hope to reduce the cost of the whole genome SNP scans. Um, either by developing next generation arrays, many arrays that can be used for breeding applications or looking at sequence-based um, SNP detection methods. Uh, and we're, we're also interested in even testing some genomic selection methodologies now that we have higher density markers that, that, that can be run on training populations and selection populations. Hopefully to try to use strawberry as, as a little test case for some genomic selection methodology to see how that might work for crops and rosacea. With that, I believe I've talked long enough and uh, happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very much for your attention.